Is there anyone out there who still isn't clear about what doing drugs does? Okay, last time. This is your brain. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? Now, I'm just going to confess something to you. I've never done drugs because of that. <laughs> when you're seven and you're eating jelly beans and you're watching cartoons after school and that comes on, that messes with your head. I don't need drugs to fry my head. That commercial did. I've never touched them because of that. It's like, I obviously don't want to do that. I don't even like eggs that way. And that's what it does to my head? It freaked me out. It still freaks me out. And it also makes me laugh. Because that commercial is so stinking serious, isn't it? Like, that was the big deal when I was a kid. You don't say no to drugs, kids. Say no to drugs. Say no to drugs. Because why? A mind is a terrible thing to waste. He showed you. Your brain, drugs, there you go. And it kept me off of them. But you know what? The reality is... When it comes to my mind, I don't need drugs to mess them up because I do a really good job myself. When it comes to my head, when it comes to my brain, to my mind, I play games in there all the time that allow them to get fried up day after day after day after day. I do a drug personally that's far more dangerous than anything that you could buy on the street and anything that can fry your brain like that. I do a jug that's called jumping to conclusions. And I do it all the time. Where I get in my head and I spend so much time there thinking and rethinking and going through this scenario and that scenario and this consequence and that potential consequence that I get way far ahead of myself and I start jumping to conclusion to conclusion to conclusion. It's the closest I come to CrossFit, people. Jumping to this and then to this and to then this. I ruin my mind a whole lot more than any drug ever could because I do a really good job of it here with anxiety or fear or doubt. Getting into a mental time machine and going ahead and trying to sort out everything and figure it all out. Mental gymnastics, playing mental chess is what I always tell people, where I'm like, if I move here and this happens, well, that's not the, but if I move this way, this could happen. And I spent all this time in my head, playing through every potential scenario, coming up with new ones, worried about this, worried about that, worried about here, worried about there. It's exhausting. In my mind, your mind, our minds are a terrible thing to waste. And when it comes to drugs, hopefully you're staying off of them, at least for this hour you are. Let me mess with your head, I guess. But really all of us are in that drug of jumping to conclusions, allowing our mind to go places that they're not meant to go. Not today, not ever. For the last couple of weeks, many of us, myself included, probably me more than anyone here, my mind has been all over the place thinking about where we are, what's going on, what I'm going to do, what Paul is going to do, what you're going to do. And it's exhausting. I'm always jumping to that next thing, to that next thing. What about this? And what about that? And what about here? What about there? And you know what I've done? And maybe some of you are in the same boat with me. I've forgotten what our founding pastor said all the time. What I've heard his wife, our outgoing executive director, say time and time again. What did, what did Dave always say? You need to suit up. You need to show up. You need to do the next right thing. He said it again and again. Paula says it again and again. And in my time with you all, I plan on saying it a lot more than I have. Because the reality is, I can't do the next right thing if my mind is 10 steps ahead. Neither can you, neither can us. We, as a gathering, as a people, we can't do the next right thing if our mind is jumping all over the place, jumping to conclusions, wondering about this, wondering about that. So today, for the next little bit, I want us to just pause for a second 
and catch our collective breath. A lot's been thrown at you the last couple of weeks. Those of you that, 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 that are consistently, this is your regular place of attendance. This is where you come. This is your church family. Some of you have been kind of been here in and out some. Maybe you're visiting for the first time. For that, I'm sorry. Just because I'm about to throw a whole lot out there. But before we go, I just want to kind of catch our breath. To collectively do that and to remember where our heads need to be, where our hearts need to be, where our hands need to be. And they need to be right here, right now for the next right thing. As we breathe in and breathe out, slow down that mind a little bit. I want us to look at one small section of scripture that I think is very poignant, very germane to where we are as a people, as a community of faith. Because we're gonna learn from a church in the New Testament who's very similar to our gathering right here. People asking that question of what's the next right thing? What's the next step? And people just like us that are very prone to jump all over the place and maybe let our heads get ahead of, of us. Let's learn about it. I want you to go, if you have a Bible with you or you want to look in the worship guide, we'll put it on the screen. I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It's in the New Testament. It's right before 2 Corinthians, and yes, I know I use that joke all the time because I think it's funny. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that's right before 1 Corinthians chapter 4, yes! Two times, two times, two services I've used that one today because I don't have that many, uh, that many tricks up my sleeve. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I want us to look there. Now, the, 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 the letter of 1 Corinthians and the letter of 2 Corinthians were letters written by Paul, who's a very important figure in the New Testament. He was one of the greatest church planners, uh, one of the greatest missionaries, probably the greatest church planner, the greatest missionary to ever grace the church. And Paul went throughout the known world and his story is chronicled in the book of Acts and his letters are preserved in the New Testament for us as his work planting churches around the world, inspiring local churches and cities to be about the gospel, to be about God's mission for those who need to know grace and love and have hope. And Paul planted the church at Corinth that this letter is named after. First and second Corinthians were written to this church. He was central to their plant. He was hands-on in helping them form. He was hands-on in selecting the leadership for that church. Many of those people, Paul was a pivotal person in helping them not just become a leader, but helping them understand what salvation meant for them, what Jesus had done for them. He loved the church at Corinth, the Corinthian people, these Christians, he loved them deeply. And very often they broke his heart. So much so that 2 Corinthians is known as Paul's tearful letter. He wrote it addressing issues in, in, in subjects that they'd kind of lost their minds. And he was helping them understand what it meant to connect to God and connect to one another. But we're going to look at his first letter, 1 Corinthians. And in chapter 3, he starts to go at an issue at the center of their church that had been creating divisiveness, creating separation, jealousy, strife, enmity amongst those people. And Paul begins to address that issue with them. Now, I'm not saying it is an issue in our church. I'm just saying it's an issue in their church. This was something that Paul needed to write about. But we look at it today because it very easily could become an issue in the gathering. It could very easily become an issue for us today, tomorrow, even 10 years from now. It very easily could be something that divides us. And what's this issue that's so big that Paul needs to take an entire chapter of Holy Scripture and go and write to them about and focus on? The issue is taking sides. You're like, wait, wait, wait. It wasn't about money or sex or something sexy like that? You know, it wasn't some like documentary thing? Taking sides? Joel, I take sides all the time. 
I like this restaurant, they like that restaurant. This is my brand of car, that's their brand of car. I'm right and they're always wrong. You know, taking sides is what we do. But when it comes to this church here in Corinth and what could potentially happen among us here, it is a major issue, a significant issue. And it's timely for where we are right now, today, as the gathering. Because when we start to take sides, what we're doing is we're going in a direction that our mind is jumping ahead on. We're jumping to conclusions. I've done it over and over again over the last three, four, five weeks. What am I going to do without Paula? Who's going to be in? Who's out? Who's committed to what we're doing? Who's going to say, who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? I'm jumping all over the place. Letting my head get ahead of me, just like these people have. Asking that question of, where am I going? Where are we going? What's going to happen? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? What happens here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and what could potentially happen there, is a bunch of chicken littles. You know the story of chicken little. The sky is falling, right? He gets hit in the head with an acorn, and he goes all over town ringing the bells, waking people up. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. He does it so much that they stop listening to him because in his mind, it was all falling apart. And very often, we can do the same thing here. What are we going to do without this person? What are we going to do without that person? What are we going to do about this or that or the other? The sky's falling. The sky's falling. You know what we do? We're forgetting who reigns over the sky and over the earth and over the mountains and over the seas and over all that dwells in it. We forget who reigns over our very minds, our very hearts, our very hands. See, it all starts right here. It very easily can fall apart right here, right here in our minds in our heads. And it all begins with what we do in our heads, where we allow them to go. That's what Paul is pointing towards as he starts to write in chapter three to this church that was taking sides. Let's look at it together. Let me read the first few verses for us. Starting in chapter three, verse one, it says this. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now, you are not yet ready, for you're still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos. Are you not being merely human? Paul starts this letter towards this issue, towards this church, towards these people, saying, you're not even ready yet. For all that you need to know, for all that you need to be about, you're not even ready yet. As you notice, he calls them infants. You're being fed with milk. You're not even ready for real food. Forget steak and cheese. You just get milk. That's all you're ready for. And I don't even know if you're ready for that. Paul is writing what what a pastor never wants to write or never wants to say. I'm glad I don't have to say it here to us today. Just simply talk about what he was saying to them. But in, a, in painful writing, in painful emotion, Paul's saying, you're not even ready for what is happening. You're not even ready for who you are, what you could be, what God is doing. No pastor wants to say it, but sometimes they have to. And Paul's putting before them, your heads are way in the wrong place. You are way away from where you need to be. He tells them that they're infants. Essentially what he's telling them is that they're being spiritually immature. Maybe to others he's pointing out that they're being spiritually proud. You're, you're all proud of the wrong things. For some, he's telling that they're morally immature. For some, he's saying they're being morally proud. Essentially, what Paul is telling this church here is that some of them are way far ahead of where God is and what God is up to. And others, he's saying you're way far behind what God is up to, where God is at. Either way, whether they're ahead of God or behind God, they're in a bad place, an unhealthy place, a place where they are missing what it means to be a people of faith. 
What are they doing? They're boasting in their leaders, he says. He says, some of you are saying, I'm all about Paul. And others are saying, I'm all about Apollos. They're, they're, they're boasting about their leaders. They're boasting about their brand. They're boasting about their gathering instead of boasting in what matters. Boasting in the gospel. Boasting in faith. Boasting in Jesus Christ. And Paul says the reason they're doing this is because of the flesh. Did you notice in four verses he said flesh three times? We talk about this from time to time. When we see a word or a phrase pop up in a very short period of scripture, we should probably take note, right? And three times in four verses, he says, you're acting in flesh. You're living in flesh. You're thinking in flesh. Now, in the New Testament, the word flesh pops up a lot. Sometimes it's used in good ways. Other times it's used in bad ways. Sometimes the word flesh is used in scripture, even by Paul himself, talking about the flesh on our bodies. Like, it's a good thing that you all have flesh over your blood and bones and guts right now. It's a good thing, as I stood in the hallway, that none of you have a flesh-eating bacteria, a virus, bringing the plague into this room. That's a good thing. Yay, good for you. Way to not have the plague, people. That's a good way of, of talking about flesh. Paul's not saying that here. He's not talking about the plague. He's not talking about flesh-eating bacteria. He's saying the flesh that they're showing is one of immaturity, is one of pride. When he uses the word flesh here, the way that he means it is he's saying you're living in an unredeemed way. Those are hard words. Those are painful words. Paul is saying when you place a personality as the most important thing to the church at Corinth or to the church of any city, any place, any gathering, when you place it about that personality, you are not living in a way that matters to people who need to know hope, who need to have faith, who need to know that Jesus loves them and cares for them. He's saying right now, in this flesh, you're boasting about the wrong things. In flesh, your mind has gotten to a place it doesn't need to be. You're far off the mark. You're jumping to conclusions. These are the things we do in our head. And it happens so frequently amongst the church that it was an issue 2,000 years ago and it can potentially be an issue right here today for us. Getting ahead of ourselves, jumping to conclusions, thinking without the wisdom and the power and the grace that God offers. And what happens when we do that, when we think and let our minds get to a place without his wisdom and his power and his grace, we become complacent or anxious or stagnant or prideful or bitter or fill in the blank. It can happen in a heartbeat because our minds start jumping to places they don't need to go. And you know what that means? It means it's no good for you. It's no good for me. It's no good for the people sitting around you. It's no good for the world that we are called to serve with love and in faith. Because all of us in this room and every person we come into contact when we leave here today needs that same wisdom and power and grace and hope that God provides to the church, that God provides to you and to me, that we can be a conduit and provide to others. All we're left with when we don't live that way, when we don't connect that way, is taking sides, lining up between one person or another. And Paul says, that's what's happening here. In verse four, he says, what are you doing? You're getting behind humans. I'm behind Paul. I'm with Paulus. I'm with this person. I'm with that person. He's saying, you're lining up behind human beings. And we cannot make this about who stands at this table. We cannot make this mission that we're about, about the person who has a title behind their name. And I'll say this, God has blessed this church with leaders, with great leaders, godly leaders. Not just David Foster or Paula Foster or Joel Reynolds, but people behind the scenes. People who have given faithfully, people who have prayed fiercely, who have shown up, who have set up and torn down Sunday after Sunday, week after week, who sit back behind that blind and make sure that the tech's working, who sit up there behind that board and make sure that, that mic, my mic goes on who make sure that there's coffee and donuts and children are taken care of and teenagers are loved and, and guests are, are served 
and valued, who have given faithfully, financially, prayerfully. But it's not about the names. It's not about the personalities. And when we allow our heads to go there, we're getting to a place that's not healthy for the leaders or for the people. It's about what God is doing in you and in the leaders. And friends, it's about what God is doing without the leaders, without you. It's that God is at work loving people and seeking to connect. And in grace, he invites us to come alongside with him. When we miss what God is up to, we lose sight of the fact that it's by God's grace that you and I are even here. I can't tell you how many times in the last couple of weeks I have heard from people who've said, I'm in. The gathering is my church home. David Foster, Paul Foster have played pivotal roles in my life, but it was God who changed my life. They helped me see that. They prayed for me about that. They encouraged me through that, but it's God who did this. That's why I'm at the gathering. That's why this is my church. That's why I want this mission to go on because God is worth it. His grace saved me. His grace sustains me. His grace serves me. And I want to be about that. It's not about who's here, whose name's on the brochure, whose picture's on the Facebook page or the website. It's about that God continues to pour out into us wisdom and power and grace so we can share hope. The people at Corinth missed this. They missed that reality. I pray, I plead, I beg that we don't miss it together. Losing sight of what matters. So what we need to do when our heads start to run away from us, we start to jump to conclusions and our brain starts frying like that infomercial. What we need to do is we need to line ourselves up. We need to place ourselves where God is at with what God is doing. And I believe he is still up to much here among us in this church for this community, for his name and his fame. So what that means pragmatically for you and I, what that means for us is that sometimes that means we need to line up behind a leader. We see that that's where God is at. I prayerfully with excitement and humility take on that role. I'm glad, honored, excited, overwhelmed to become the pastor here, to be the leader here. And I ask that you line up with me because my goal is not to make this about Joel. My goal is to be where God is at, to every day wake up and say, God, what are you doing and how do I get there fastest? To line up where God is. For you guys to join me in that incredible journey of faith. But for others, what that means practically is that it means maybe finding a new leader. For some of you, this has been a great season of life and ministry. This has been a great place to be in fellowship and in community. But maybe that means it's time to go and take your gifts elsewhere. That's okay. We can still be friends. I hope we, I, I'm, I'm up for it. I hope you are too. You can take me out to lunch anytime. Or maybe it means I start going in a way that makes zero biblical sense and you're like, hey, he has gone off the deep end. I always knew he was a little screwy, but now he's way screwy. I'm gonna find a new leader. Or perhaps practically what it means for you is that it's time for you to become the leader that God has made you to be the talents and ability, the riches of who you are to be able to apply that in a whole fresh, new, exciting way right here, right now to be who God has made you to be. That happens when we stop letting our head jump ahead of itself. We place ourselves where God has had and we start to align it with our heart. That's a difficult thing. The, the hardest journey that we make every day is from here to here and here to here. That little gap of, of 10 inches is difficult. But when we align our heads and our hearts, we start to put our minds where God is at and see what God is doing in our very spirits, in our very souls. It's difficult, yes, but it is where God is at, where God is working in you and me and us. 
There's a lot of things that we do in our head, but we need to be reminded of what God does in our hearts, in your hearts. Our heads need to come back to that place that God's workshop, God's very workshop where he is working the hardest at is in your hearts. Our minds forget that when we run away. When our heads take off and start jumping to conclusions, that's our playground. And far too often it leads us to places we don't need to be. We forget that God is at work in your heart because of his care, his love, his belief in you. Paul reminds that to the church here in Corinth. And I think he reminds it to us here. Look in verse five as he continues teaching them. He says this, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I, Paul, is saying, Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters, they're one. And each will receive the wages according to their labor. For we are God's fellow workers and you are God's field. You are God's building. See, the people in Corinth were lining up behind personalities, behind names, behind humans. And Paul talks about it. He says, what is Apollos? Well, Apollos was a very important leader in the church at Corinth. He was a powerful communicator. He was charismatic. He had a huge following. And what made Apollos significant to that church is he was physically there. This is where he was from. This is where he was ministering. So the people saw him day to day and week to week and month to month. And their minds, jumping in conclusions, were like, well, I gotta be with the guy who's here, right? There he is. I'm gonna get behind him. And so they were saying, this is all about Apollos. Not this is all about God and what God is up to. It's about Apollos and that's where I'm gonna be. And Paul goes, but what is Paul? Who am I? What, what am I in all this? Paul was very cerebral, strategic, theologically sound. He himself talked about how he wasn't the greatest of communicators. But he was there and consistent, loving, powerful in his teaching. And a lot of people lined up behind him. But what made that difficult is Paul wasn't there. That's why he's writing a letter because he was somewhere else. Paul was moving throughout the world, helping churches, planting churches, reaching out to those who needed preaching the gospel. And so some people in their minds were jumping to conclusions and they were like, well, he's not here. I can't get behind him. And others were like, well, even though he's not here, that's still, that, it, this is about Paul. And Paul says, what is Apollos? What am I? The answer is servants is what he said. Did you notice that? He says, we are servants. And don't let servant go to something that we think today it's somebody in a tuxedo and they meet you at the door and they've got a linen cloth over their arm, they polish your shoes and they bring you food on fancy china. No, when he says servants here, he meant slaves, sharecroppers, bond servants, that they were about something that was far greater than them, more important than their name, more important than their fame. They were about the mission of God and that's what mattered to them. They didn't let their heads get away from them, Paul and Apollos. They didn't let their hearts get away from them. They were taking what God was giving to them and they were sending it out. One planted, one watered, but it was God who was doing it. Did you notice that? God gives the growth, Paul said. It is God who grew Paul and Apollos in the church at Corinth. And it is God who grows me and Paula and you in the gathering. It is God who grows the leaders. It is God who grows the church. It is God who grows the people. Paul says, he who plants and he who waters, they're one. He doesn't even name who it was. Some days it's Paul who waters. Doesn't matter today. One of them is doing something. It's not Apollos who plants. Maybe he's doing that today. Maybe he's not. They're the same. Whether it's Paul or Apollos, they are about God and bringing hope to people. And it's not about who stands at this table and if their last name is Reynolds or Foster or whoever comes next. It's about that we gather together because we believe God is worthy of our worship and people need to know about his love for them. A godly leader is important. Paul's not saying that they're not important here. They're important. Apollos and Paul and whoever the leaders are. 
It was important when David was here. It's important that I'm here. It's important that Paul is here. But it is not about us and our names and our brand and who's on the website and who's on the bulletin. It is about grace according to Paul, according to Scripture, according to God because it is by his grace that we're still standing. It's by his grace that we're still breathing. And it is grace that grows. It is grace that will grow the gathering. It is grace that will grow you and I. It is grace that will grow this community and the leaders. It is by grace, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, God giving grace again and again. And friends, grace never fails. Can I be completely transparent? I'm going to let you down. I'm probably already letting you down right now because I continue to talk. I will mess up and I will fail just like David did, just like Paula did, just like so many leaders and pastors do. We struggle and make mistakes, but we do it in grace. That's our intention, that's our heart. When I mess up, it is in grace that I mess up because it's grace that sustains me and it's grace that sustains you. Because grace never fails, even when a leader does. It is grace for Paul. It is grace for Apollos. It is grace for the church at Corinth. It is grace for the leaders. It is grace for the people. It is grace for you. It is grace for me. It is grace for us. Because Paul says in verse 9 that we are fellow workers. Paul, Apollos, Joel, Paula, you, me, us, we are fellow workers. Whether you've been here for eight years or eight months or eight weeks or eight days or eight minutes, and yes, I know I've been talking for a lot longer than eight minutes. Just go with me on this theme. We are fellow workers no matter how long you've been here, no matter how much or how little you give, no matter what talent or lack of talent you bring, we are all fellow workers here working for the cause of bringing God's glory to Franklin, God's glory to Tennessee, God's glory to the earth. This is our field. You are this building. We are these people. This is where God is at work. What this does for you and I, what this does for us is this puts our hands at work right now, today, See, what we need to do is once we place ourselves where God is at, we need to position ourselves to receive what God has, what he's pouring out to each one of us. Grace, grace abundant, grace free, because he cares for you. Because he isn't done with us. Because he believes in us. He believes in you. He wants us to go forward in this mission of bringing his hope and peace and grace. See, he's been preparing the gathering for this moment. Not from two weeks ago or two months ago or two years ago. He's been preparing the gathering for this moment since the beginning of time. Since the foundations of this earth, he has been preparing us to have a hands that work and once our heads and our hearts are in line with that, it then becomes a question of what do we do with our hands? What do we do with this work? Let me look at two more verses with you and then I'll shut up, I promise. Verse 10, chapter three says this. According to, there it is, the grace that we just talked about, the grace of God given to Paul, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and now someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care of how he builds upon this foundation. For no one can lay a foundation other than that foundation which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. Do you notice that there? This foundation that we build upon as a gathering, as a church, as a people, is not the foundation of David or Paula or Joel or whoever. It's the foundation of Jesus Christ. Paul built upon that. David built upon that. I will do everything in my power and strength to build upon that, that Jesus is the foundation. When did this happen? Is this something about who's up here right now or where we are in the season we're in? Is it, did this happen eight years ago when this church started? Did this happen when David passed away or Paula stood up and many of you courageously continued to show up and to give and to be? Did this happen when I showed up? No. This foundation was laid since the beginning of time. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says this. Let me give it to you real quick. 
I know I told you two more verses, but I'm going to give you three. But I'm going to bribe you with cookies this afternoon so it all works out. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says this. For we, you, I, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand. That beforehand doesn't mean an hour before or a day before. That beforehand means sovereignly since the beginning of time, before time, before the earth, that we should walk, serve, give, build in him, in them, for this reason and purpose. This foundation of Jesus Christ has been laid. And we build upon that. David built upon that. Paula built upon it. I'm going to build upon it. I call you to build upon that as well. Because that's what people need. They don't need the name of Joel or Paula or David or whoever. They need the name of Jesus. So friends, that's what we're going to declare. We're going to declare three things today, next Sunday, the Sunday after that, every Sunday from here on. This is what we're going to continue to declare. It's what David declared. It's what I'm going to declare, that Jesus saves, only Jesus. Jesus, only Jesus saves. Only Jesus sustains. Only Jesus serves. What all that's going to look like, I'll be honest with you, I have no idea. You're like, Joel, what's the strategy? What ideas do you have? Jesus, that's all I got. But that's the best place to start. That's the best foundation to build upon. The foundation of Joel or Paula Foster will crumble. But the name of Jesus, the source of Jesus, the foundation of Jesus is what we need. It's what you need. It's what the world needs. And that's what we're going to build upon. It's going to look different from day to day, from year to year. But we're going to keep building there. We're going to use different strategies and different ideas. We're going to have different people. We'll have different sounds at times and different looks. we have different names and concepts, but it's all going to be built on the name of Jesus because only Jesus saves. Only Jesus sustains us. Only Jesus can serve us and serve others. So that's what we're going to declare. Because when our head and our heart are aligned, it puts our hands to work. And we need to prepare ourselves to be working where God is at. That's our goal. And where is God at? He's at the foundation that he built, that he laid of his son, Jesus Christ, the cross, the gospel, salvation for us and for those who need it outside the walls of this room. That's where we're going to be. That's what we're going to talk about today. That's what we're going to talk about all the days here to come. Jesus only Jesus, because that's what the world needs. That's the foundation that God laid. That is the leader of our church. Will you guys pray with me? Father, there is much to do. There's still much to say. There's still much to overwhelm, and there's still much that will take our minds to all these places that we don't need to go. So we thank you for the powerful, beautiful, simple reminder that it's Jesus that we find faith in, Jesus that we have hope in, Jesus that we receive grace from. May it be Jesus that we declare in our songs and share in our service and grow in, in our faith and our devotion. May Jesus be the one true pastor of this church. And may we follow him faithfully with all of our heart, seeking your wisdom, your strength, your grace for this day, for this gathering, so we can take that name into this world. May we be about that today, God, for your name and for your glory. Thank you for the people here. Thank you for who helped build to where we are now and who will help build as we move into the future together. Thank you for the beautiful name of Jesus. We build upon that. We pray in that name. We have all of our hope in that name. And Jesus, only Jesus. It's in his name that I pray, in his name that I cling. Amen. And amen. I'm so glad you guys were here today. Thank you for letting me ramble a little bit. Could you tell I wrote that on vacation? It's just filled with sugar and anxiety and humidity. It's pretty much all it was. There's like coffee stains in there and sweat stains. But I needed a chance to share in my heart, to talk about who we are and where we're going. And if you want to continue that conversation, come join us in about an hour as we meet at the Innocent House to do our gathering for the gathering, to talk about what's next for us, for you, for me, for 
our church as we move forward together. If you can't be a part of that, and many have said they couldn't, message me this week. You know, email me. I'll be loitering down here for a little while. If you have a question or concern, come and talk to me. Let's keep this conversation going because together, together, we're going to keep building upon that foundation of Jesus Christ. You guys got it? All right, good. Get out of here. I'll see you later. Have a great day.